afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. And um, welcome to University of Ghana School of Laws, Law and Crisis Seminar. Today we are looking, we are discussing women's political status and representation in Ghana. We can all admit and we, could, we all know that women have been at the forefront of political activity from before our independence, during independence, till today, um, 63 years after independence. We have taken so many roles as women in supporting our um, political endeavors. We've had market women, educationists, nurses, broadcasters, judges, lawyers, in the political trenches, tirelessly built, trying to build a strong democracy with representation by all Ghanaians. You know, we can mention so many names, but for the purposes of this seminar, I'm going to mention a couple of names. Um, Susan Alhassan, Ayanori Bukhari, Victoria Nyako, Sophia Doku, Mary Cranting, Regina Asamini, Grace Ayensu, Christiana Wilmot, Comfort Asamoa, and Lucy Enim. You know, I have the privilege of mentioning these names because back in June 16th, 1960, the representation of the People's Bill was passed. And this was particularly called the Women's Members Bill. And these 10 women were elected unopposed as members of parliament in June, 1960. That was back in 1960. We're here today to have this conversation to ask, where are we now? And to do this, I have an awesome panel of academics and political practitioners, a good mix of theory and practice to have this conversation so that we can bring ourselves to scratch and see the way forward for women in political representation. So first and foremost, I have Professor Akosia Dankwa, who is the head of the Department of Sociology in the University of Ghana, Ligon. I have Dr. Benjamin Kunbo, a politician and lecturer also at the University of Ghana at the School of Law. I also have Professor Audrey Gajapo. She is the Dean of Information and Communication Studies at the University of Ghana. And last but not the least, I have Dr. Suzanne Edouard Mankwa. She's the Executive Secretary of the National Interest Movement. Dr. Edouard Mankwa was formerly with the CPP and is a politician with her boots on the ground at the moment. Welcome, panelists, and um, thank you for being part of it. Thank you. So, it's, it's quite an interesting spectrum when you look at women in political, um, in public office, women in political representation. I would ask Dr. Um, Akusha Dankwa, who's done quite extensive research on this topic, to give us, put, give us the context we're discussing this in. Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be, and thanks, Sophia, for the introductions. I will start with um, a table, a table that's been generated by, actually, I think this, this table was actually generated by my co-author in the work that we've been doing for the last four or five years. Um, so I work with Gretchen Bauer from the University of Delaware, and we've been looking at women in politics for the last five years. So this table comes from our work and um, it shows you, I hope you can see, that basically the percentage of women MPs since 1960. So in 1960, Kwame Nkrumah basically passed Ghana's first affirmative action. Well, he didn't pass the bill, but he basically put in place an affirmative action to ensure that there were women in that first parliament. So we had 8.8%. We went up to 9.1% in 65 was 1.4 in 69, 3.679. Then for the fourth Republic, we've had eight, nine, 9.5 in 2000, 10.9 in 2004, 8.7 in 2008, 10.9 in 2012, and 13.1 in 2016. 
Um, when you look on the far right, we've got the percentage of women candidates. So what that tells you is going into the election, what percent of the candidates are women? And if you look closely, we actually vote in a fair number of those who show up to stand. So when we've had 5.2 women candidates, by the time we actually elect, we are up to 8%. So our numbers are low, but our numbers show that when women do stand, we will vote for them. So if we had more women standing, at least at the parliamentary level, what our statistics are showing us is that we vote fairly well for the women who do stand eventually. When you look at our current situation for 2020, we have for the NDC 23 candidates, seven of them are incumbent, 16 of them are new. For the NPP, we have 24, 14 of them are incumbent, 10 are new. And we'll find out in two or three weeks how many of them end up there finally. So these are our statistics for parliamentary level. I don't have the statistics for district assembly level. They are lower than these figures. So in 1994, we had 3%, 1998 was 5%, 2002 was 7%, and it hasn't really changed much. Basically, if you look at what has been happening in the Fourth Republic, our numbers are really not something to write home about. They are quite embarrassing, frankly. And I can show you how embarrassing we are if we compare ourselves to women in parliament in Africa for 2019. So in Rwanda, it's 61%, Namibia, 46%. In West Africa, Senegal is 42%. Cameroon, 31%. Okay, so our 13% doesn't look good at all. Sub-Saharan Africa has an average of 23.9%. We are 10 percentage points below the South Africa, the Sub-Saharan African rate. And in fact, you can say that Ghana contributes to the rate being low, the average being low, because other countries have far higher rates than we do. So that's what the numbers look like. But we started off very well in 1960 because back in 1960, Ghana was actually one of the first African countries to put in place a quota because that member's bill was pretty much a quota to have women, female representation. Dr. Kumbo, where did we go wrong? Is there any legislation or laws that um, have put us far be behind our peers? Well, yes, I, I guess that it is a, a retrogression if one would say so, because if you do not come up with an affirmative action in which seats, and I mean safe seats, are ceded by political parties to women, you continue to have a problem which is a relationship of the way politics has become. I guess that in the 60s, that could be done because we had a very strong euphoria for our development initiatives with relatively a progressive leadership in terms of the political party in power that perhaps people would say today was ahead of their time. But they did anticipate the potential of women and their contribution to political activity. You would also notice that during that period, uh, you had the CPP women's wing, the popular Makajias, who were very, very instrumental in political work, and particularly down to very remote parts of the country. So they had a relatively strong and politically informed voice, and I'm sure all that culminated in the quota that came up at that period. Subsequently, you would see that the political parties have been different in terms of their gender outlook. And uh, as a result, you have this challenge of suffering, the relative dwindling figures in terms of percentages as we see now. Yes, and um, Dr. Gajapo, you have something to add to that? Audrey? Sorry, I, I, I should unmute. Yes, I just wanted to add to the history and to remind us that actually we find women in the political space during the colonial era as well. And I think we'll be remiss if we didn't remember 
that in 1951, before independence, Mabel Davdankwa ran for the Gan rural constituency and won. And mm. I'm also reminded that there were other women who ran um, but didn't win. For example, Nancy Tibu, who was the wife of um, the newspaper publisher uh, Tibu, she also ran in, I think, the Ashanti constituency. She lost as well. And then also people like uh, Mercy uh, Folks Crab, who were women, but also part of the um, Gold Coast Legislative Council at a certain period in time. So there were precedents even before independence of women's representation in the political space. So why are we still behind? There has to be a reason, there has, there ha, there have to be real tangible reasons why we, we are at 18, 8.8 um, .8 or 8.9% 8 or 13%. The, the numbers are definitely not encouraging. Akosia, why are we behind? So there are many ways to look at this, right? We have to look at the institutional things. So what are political parties doing or not doing? What kind of um, system did we choose in terms of the voting system? We could have chosen a proportional representation system, for example, and we didn't. We chose a first past the post system. Then there are all the sociological reasons as well. I'll leave the institutional to Dr. Kumbo and we can come back to that and focus for now on the sociological. Right, the, the reasons why when a woman stands, she has a difficult time. And in work that we've done, we basically argue that there are two sets of reasons. One is what we call the cost of politics. And the other is what we call the politics of insults. So now the cost of politics is not just um, a problem that men face. In Ghana, uh, elections and electioneering period is known as a time for chopping. It's cocoa season, right? People have to pay for t-shirts. So if you want to stand, you have to make t-shirts, you have to make posters, you have to have meetings, you will rent canopies, you will rent chairs, we need refreshments, we need TNT. On the day of the election, you have to bus us there, you have to feed us lunch, give us some money, there's that, there is what will happen after the elections. I mean, we've done interviews with people who didn't win. And yet the community members are coming to them for school fees, I'm getting married, I have a funeral. So there are all of those costs. If you are female, we live in a country where women's assets are lower than men's assets. So there's work that has been done by Professor Abuno Drew in the Department of Economics. It's about a decade old now. She did a study of gender assets in Ghana and wrote a book about the gender assets gap where she basically calculates and finds that of the total wealth in this country, women owned 30% and men owned the 70% that was left. So women go into the campaign not having as much by way of personal assets on average than the men do, which will mean that they have to raise it somehow. Now in raising that, you find that our sociological situation comes up where, as some of our um, respondents said, there's an unspoken language that it has to be quid pro quo. There, there might be a sense from the people you are raising the money from that, well, if I give her money, maybe I should get something in return. If they are not thinking that, the electorate is thinking you raise that money that way anyway. So either way you lose. You lose if you actually do it that way. You get the money by exchanging something for it. You lose even if you don't because people think you did anyway. So whereas the men have a much easier time when they are going in to raise the money, nobody's having any funny thoughts about them. Women have the problem where whether or not you buy into it is not what matters. It's what people think. And people are likely to think that you exchange something for the money, right? So that's the bit about the cost of politics. When it comes to the politics of insults, that's much more a problem that women 
face. The men are not finding themselves at the brunt of this. And there's a whole range of ways in which that happens. So you find that women find that they are being policed. Their bodies primarily are being policed. So your hairstyle has to be conformed to what Ghanaians think hairstyles should be. You can't have locks. If you have the locks, it can't be too long. You can't dye your hair. If you dye it, you have to only dye it black. If you have gray hair, you are not allowed any other color. It can't be in a style that Ghanaians don't think of as conventional. Some women talked about, you can't wear trousers to some communities. We are policing you in terms of what we expect average Ghanaian women to do. A nice Ghanaian woman, she gets married when she's about 24, and then she proceeds very quickly to have two children if you live in Accra. If you live outside Accra, you're expected to have more. Ideally, the two children should probably be a boy and a girl. Otherwise, you might get into trouble for that as well. So you find that people are querying, what are you doing here trying to stand for an election? Where's your husband? Where are the kids, right? You should be at home cooking and cleaning and not engaged in this sort of um, behavior. Or you are being called a flirt or you are basically a prostitute or you are slipping your way through. So there are all of these insults that basically come your way simply because you are female and dare to participate in something that you have a right to, but our norm suggests that you don't or you shouldn't have a right to it. So let me stop there and have others come in. I'm sure um, Professor Gajepo can speak to the ways in which the media. Yeah, as, 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 as one of the key institutions that we, 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 um, we hope to bring up the positives of women in public office, the media definitely is key. And Dr. Gajapo, Professor Gajapo, if you could tell us how the media has contributed or not contributed to um, putting women at the forefront. Sure, it's, it's, a, it's a whole poem that I'm going to <laughs> be reading, but I wanted to add a few examples to the points that um, um, uh, uh, Professor Dakwa made. Um, about how inhospitable politics is to, to women. And, and it's the nature, of course, of our political culture. I'm sure uh, uh, Dr. Edouard Manko will have more concrete examples than me. But yeah. when she mentioned the issue of hair, I was reminded that even at the vetting in parliament, people took on, if you will remember, um, uh, the, the former gender minister, uh, Otiko Jabba for her hair. I have, and dating back to the old parliament, um, when, um, oh, what's the name of the former, she used to be the former minister for, was it education, but also headmistress, uh, Mrs. Yabua came before parliament. I remember very, very well at her vetting they asked her about her boyfriend. So you see, women are held to a certain moral standard that men are not held to. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many examples of that. I have talked to women in parliament who have shared their war stories. Again, dating from the first parliament. And one that stuck with me was a, a, a woman who, uh, a, a woman MP, who said, told us how, you know, you have to go and campaign at night. Sometimes the networking uh, arrangements are such that you are meeting people at night. People are suspicious. They call you names, as uh, uh, Professor Dakwa said. And then she said, you see, I'm, I'm lucky. It was easier for me to be uh, uh, voted because I was a widow. I had no husband. Then another one, many years later, in this current parliament, told me about all kinds of things people were telling her husband and that if she didn't have the kind of husband that had a lot of support for her and, 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 and they enjoyed uh, serious trust, one of the things for sure that would have broken is her marriage. And therefore there's a, a high social price to pay. And I asked myself when, when I was thinking of this, that we should just look at the institutions of socialization, family, religion, school and education, then the media, which you have asked me to speak on. What attitudes do they have towards women 
in the political space. How women in political space portrayed, represented, talked about, perceived, supported within these uh, spaces. And then you begin to see the magnitude of the problem. Nice girls, your family say, oh, you want to do politics, please, no. You know, so the, the family as a key socialization institution would be the first to discourage you. As for school and education, they have already constructed images in your mind that shows that it's men who become presidents, not women. Don't take women who want to be presidents seriously. It can be an aspiration, okay? When it comes to religion, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. But again, so by the time we come to the media, we know that the forces are actually culturally arraigned against women who want to be in the political space as presidential candidates, as parliamentarians. And I have to say, it's not just in Ghana. Just think that the US with their long history of democracy, it was only a few weeks ago that they actually are going to get a woman vice president. Mm -hmm. They've never had a woman president. After Margaret Thatcher in the UK, I don't know how many years ago, Theresa May briefly. And so even our so-called mature democracies have a problem. And I just wanted to put that on the table. And maybe I've talked too much. I'll come back to the media. I know others may want to add to this, but I definitely have a lot to say about media coverage. But I thought I should also talk about how we are socialized. Yes, and the socialization is very important. You know, for the last week, I've been talking to young girls, I've been talking to um, school going children, and it's not in our curriculum. I, I, I tell them who is Hannah Kujo, and they have no idea who Hannah Kujo is. Who is Susan Al Hassan? They have no idea who Susan Al Hassan is. So, education as an institution definitely has a very important role to play in embedding in our psyche, in the female psyche and male psyche, that females in public life is a norm. And this goes back, as he said, Audrey, to way before um, independence. But we are, we are um, fortunate to have Susan here. Susan, give us the real life, um, real life take on being a woman in politics. Well, I mean, it's, it's a tough one. And, and just like um, the previous speakers have said, um, you know, you face all these things. You know, they talk about the ambition gap and make it look like, oh, women are less ambitious than men. And, uh, and that is why women don't aspire for a high office. But it, I, I don't think so. I mean, it, I mean um, ambition is not genetically geared towards the male gender and not the female gender. I mean, women are just as ambitious, but it's the environment in which they find themselves. You know, the environment is not nurturing of their ambition. And, and the previous speakers have talked about all the things that uh, go with it. But if men find themselves in, a, in an atmosphere or in a political party or um, environment which nurtures that ambition, they are just as ambitious as men and will, will go for the, the, the top office. So it's really the, the, the socialization and the environment in which women you know, uh, find them, uh, themselves. Um, the, the society has made it look like the biological function of the woman determines that she should stay in a, in a, a particular uh, <laughs> position. And like having children will make you less ambitious or having children makes you less of a material to be a, a, a presidential um, candidate or um, go for the top office in, in, your, in your party. And, uh, and they have pushed that. But I always also give this analogy where the biological function of women have um, you know, uh, pushed us to, to a stage where we, we are not at power with the men. I give the example, a man and a, a, a woman finish school, um, university at 25 or 23. 
they go immediately into, into politics. Well, maybe they were into their party politics, they were in the youth wings of their um, political parties. Then, you know, 25, they are there. They're expecting the woman to marry. Nobody's expecting a 25 year old man to marry, you know. Uh, so the pressure on the woman is to marry. She marries and then she must have children. So she's 25, she has a child at 26. Um, you know, she has the second child at maybe 28 and she has to wait for these children to, to grow. Meanwhile, her counterpart, who was also in the youth group, he's still in the politics and is then, now she's getting married, she's catching to the needs of her husband and catching to the needs of babies. Now the babies are there till about 10, 15. So she's now 40. The man who she started off is also 40, but he has 15 years in that party of consistently being in the party and contributing to the party. She sporadically comes in, maybe she has a baby, she goes out in and, in and out. And they are not counting that, you, you, you understand? They are looking at, well, the man being there. So they, they are 40 and then they go to compete for the same position. It is made to look like, well, the man has been here and he's been, you know, all this time. Whereas the woman, oh, well, we, we saw her when she was in the youth group, but she vanished for a while, you know, and things like that. And so it's, they have, uh, you know, society has pushed our biological function of having children and nurturing children to such a way that we seem to be disadvantaged, you know, because you go out there and you're competing, you're just as capable as him, you have the same commitment as him in the party, you can, uh, you know, um, go head to head or toe to toe with him in the party, and yet, because he seemed to have been there consistently for the last 15 years, you know, he, he, he will get the top job and you may not. So these are some of the, um, you know, obstacles that really hinder women in politics, not because they are capable, but just because that, you know, society says that you should take the back seat. And is it any different if you're at the local government level and if you're at the national level? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's the, the nuances are slightly different at the local government level. Um, yes, quite a, I was pleasantly surprised um, to find out that quite a number of women do compete at the local level. But again, they don't compete always um, to be the assembly member, they compete to be unit um, um, uh, unit member because they believe that okay um, being in the unit committee one it is easier to win <laughs> if you are in the unit committee it may be easier to win less expensive for you to win in the unit committee and 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 you are um, uh, how would I put it people are more likely to vote for you because you're not that ambitious. You know, you're not head to head or to 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 with somebody. So, oh, she's a unit committee or one for month, you know, that kind of thing. And, but there are quite a number of women also that compete for their uh, uh, assembly membership. And they face the same situations where, you know, um, you, you are buying Wellington boots because they're going to do a cleanup. So you have to buy the Wellington boots. So you have to buy the wheelbarrows that they use to clean up and all, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the same financial constraints are, are, are there. And all the other things that are there for, you know, um, partisan politics competitions are there for the local competition. Um, there are some institutions that try to help a little more, um, like the, the Electoral Commission, um, you know, try to help by getting, um, you know, um, maybe some funding for the women to have t-shirts, et cetera, so that that burden is taken off them and giving them this training on what really an, an assembly woman should be so that it can, giving them a platform so that they can campaign. So there is some help there, but the obstacles are really, really, really the, the same as if you were going for any political, um, partisan political position, and it's it's really is tough. So, Doctor um, Doctor Kumbo, you mentioned that we had retrogressed. Do you have any pointers to why we have retrogressed to our th current thirteen percent? Uh, yes, I, I guess that we we have a problem also in this country in terms of 
conversations on very, very important topics like gender participation. And in that process, we are asked not to go back to some of our foundational concepts of the nature of our society before we can launch into the more mechanical manifestation of effects that we see in the institutions. Firstly, the way our social structure is being reproduced is very remarkable when it comes to gender participation in all spheres of life. And I like just basically to use this dichotomy we have drawn and maintained over the years between the public and private spheres into which we slot family and gender matters into the private sphere, claiming that that is where nobody else should intrude, regardless of how oppressive that particular space is. Now, when you have that type of situation, embedded in it is the fact that the males are for the public sphere and the females are for the private sphere. Now, with this dichotomy is what reproduces what we are seeing today, where they say politics is for men and not for women. No scientific explanation for that. Then immediately you see the practical side of how our society and some of its structures are reproduced. You see it in the institutional forms, and you see it in the legal forms that structure those institutions. I remember when I was in parliament, there are very, very simple things you use to see beyond the challenges of women getting into parliament, when they get into parliament, the performance and access and capacity to develop quickly and learn how to climb the parliamentary ropes becomes difficult. One example, when we parliamentary committees are actually the building block and where almost all parliamentary work takes place. Quite often parliamentary committee work takes place on very important matters outside the House of Parliament and possibly outside Accra. Mm. The first thing I noticed was that it becomes very, very difficult for most women parliamentarians to combine their domestic chores together with going with their male counterparts. Mm. And yet it is at these meetings that your standing orders and most of the issues are brought up and you learn. And you also have the unofficial interaction of which members of parliament in a more relaxed environment share their experiences in terms of how they can develop. One of the things I noticed is that, first of all, those discussions take place with around beer that most ladies will not want to be around. Secondly, the hours are late. Thirdly, there are so many sexist remarks that are made there and not all women parliamentarians are very comfortable with those sexist remarks. So as a result, by the time you get to the floor, six months into parliament, where the learning curve of actually understanding your standing orders, you see that the women would be losing now. Then the second problem that you have, have to do with how the parliamentary leadership itself can begin to implement affirmative action, even if the national institutions are not in a position to do that. I was chairing the legal committee of the Pal uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, where we had advocated that this minimum of 40% representation should be achieved as much and as fast as possible. All the Commonwealth countries that came, there was a pledge and undertaking that they would use the parliamentary structures to make sure that this was achieved. When we went back for a review on that item, it became clear that the numbers after the 2016 elections had dropped instead of increasing. And even countries that were performing very well had actually come down. Now, when you put all these things together, I think that we must be operationalizing some of the concepts in more concrete forms than just making them cliches. And I believe we'll launch into the issue of participation or active and full participation of women in politics. But in terms of how you even aggregate the numbers into political positions and particularly in parliament. Audrey has given us together with Professor all the issues that women encounter, but there are more subtle forms 
in which this is done. I must say I'm happy as I begin to monitor a number of the activities that most of the women who are doing well in parliamentary politics have decided to push back. Because it looks very easy even at the district level just to raise issues that, of course, this lady getting into politics is using her body or her feminine position or biological situation to get to where she's getting to. And I have come across a number of women who will not go on the defensive and will say, well, in one particular case, he says, oh, if this is what you think, are you interested? You're also welcome to participate in it. You could see the withdrawal immediately. So our ladies have to learn the language and tactics of how to push back on some of these issues instead of just folding your arms and then letting it look like this society is looking at me in this way. I never agreed with Margaret Thatcher when she said there was no such thing as society. But upon a hindsight, you will be looking at it that what we see as society are individual idiosyncrasies and what they think of a situation which they try to project to make it look like is the society. Because even people who don't know me as a woman, why will they be harboring those conceptions about the methods, the means I use to also get into political office? It certainly cannot be the society that we, do, we have not even defined and cannot indicate what it is. So we need a, a way of getting ladies to actually push back. I used to be invited to South Africa where I had a lot of work to do with the gender committees, particularly women who were in the security sector. And I could see that they have started building a number of structures within all the complicated maze of parliamentary procedures to be able to perform credibly and encourage many more women to come into parliament. Lastly, I would indicate that parliament itself has become a very, very oppressive and intimidating spatial location. If you were to look at the, the acoustics that is within the particular way in which parliamentary structures are constructed, you would be surprised that as you rise on the floor to make a statement, the, the, the type of echoes and the type of cut calls that come, comes directly onto your mic. And I used to observe the ladies when they are on the floor. And once that type of situation comes up, they are already disoriented. And we believe that there's a way in which you can restructure this type of situation. Then you also create the traditional hostile camps, government and opposition, put them in amphitheaters. That whole spatial representation is suggesting that it doesn't matter whether the person on the other side of the aisle is a woman or not. You should be interested in the male chauvinistic positions that are taken on your side of the aisle, regardless of whether they are actually inhibiting factors against getting women to perform creditably in parliament. There are a number of these little, little things. Then you get to even places of convenience and you will begin to see that ladies are more comfortable going to other areas. There was a time that I noticed that the male had their private places on the floor and the females had their private places on the ground floor. And I used to ask the question when the refurbishing was taking place, is it not possible for you to have both on the same side of the floor? And there are these little, little things that come together to make it very difficult for women's performance in parliament. But more significantly, as to whether women will come into parliament, will participate fully and actively, depends on the nature of your parliamentary leadership. Mm -hmm. Starting from the, the speaker's own sensitivity to gender issues, the minority and majority leader, your whips, and, and the way they compose this, almost everywhere except Ajua Safo that managed to become a substantive whip. It is always the issue of the second whip of either side being a woman and all the rest of the leadership of either side are men. And this makes it very, very difficult. Take the business committee 
in which the agenda for prioritizing the business of the house are set. As I chaired the business committee over the years, I found that we hardly had more than four women mm. in a committee of about 21. And so if you were to talk about something of putting something on a certificate of agency to get a loan from a country to go and do infrastructure and whether an affirmative action bill or an amendment to the intestate succession bill should be put on the business statement. You begin to see it. Look, look, let this thing wait. Uh, uh, we will deal with it later. Yeah. As yeah. it waits, parliament rises on recess. And technically after the four years, that matter is, as, is dead and has to be brought back and started at the first stage before it gets on. And we have tried a number of gender related legislation that have come to parliament and they have run into these problems. Then the women cannot operate effectively in parliament without a linkage with civil society organizations that are advocating gender issues outside. Because you need that level of capacity of gender civil society organizations to help make their research work easier, to have bullet points, the issues that they should be focusing on. And at the same time, telling them the particular critical stage in the lawmaking process and what type of interventions can be made at that time. Yeah. I've been doing these training programs in a number of countries, and now we have a chat. And we tell them, if you do not intervene at this particular point, then the battle is lost. I will come back on this subsequent. Yes, and Dr. Kumbo, this has been actually very invaluable. You telling us from a male perspective, the barriers that women face when they go through all the hurdles to get into public office, into parliament. Thank you so very much. And, um, you know, we keep on throwing a couple of numbers up and down. Um, I know for a long time that 40% was what was the benchmark. Everybody was trying to get to 40%. And in our case, 40% translates into 100, um, 100 parliamentarians when we talk about, when we um, look at parliament. But what number is enough? Akosia, what number would you say is enough? What should we fight for? The uh, percentage in the population. I mean, when, if you look at our population, and this is not just Ghana, around the world, women make up about 51% of the population. Mm -hmm. So the idea already that, well, women make up 51% of the population, but in public life, we only want to see 40% of them show up. Reflects Dr. Kumbo's point about we've got our public life and our private life, and the public is for the men. So if we are being nice to you, as for 51%, it's too high. We'll give you 40. That should be good enough because you, you know, you started at about 10% or not. In an ideal world, we will have 51% women, 49% men. We'll reflect the balance, the gender balance in the society, in our parliament. When we are doing parliamentary um, even when we are thinking in terms of who should be advised presidential candidates and so on, we are very clear in Ghana that regional balance is a good thing. And when we talk about regional balance, we mean balance it out. We don't say, okay, let's do a token here and a token there. And we need to get to that point in our conversations on gender, where it's not that there are, women are being done a favor, but that we have as much right to this space as the men do. Um, so I, Akosia, right. you want you want fifty percent? Yes, actually, I think I want fifty-one percent because I think the last time I checked, that was our population. The percentage. Fifty-one percent. Yes. Susan, how much is enough? Um, I think for me, enough will be where it's not even a conversation. It's not a topic. It's not anything because we are there in the numbers at the decision-making table and are making an impact. And there's a, there's a you know, um, there's a, uh, I mean, we have a right to be there. It is the norm. That is when it will be enough. And if, if that is 51, that is 70%, I'm all for it. At the moment, there's no balance. And so, you know, um, we have to get to the point where if you have, you know, women at the decision, or even if it is all the all women or extra, it is not an 
extraordinary thing. It, it's, it is the norm because we are seen as having the same amount of intellect, ambition, drive, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, all the attributes that leadership should have. You understand that we are leading people and it is not an extraordinary thing. And for me, it is only then that it will be enough. And so, you know, we, we have to work at getting there where you, you have all these um, 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 positions that women are there and eyebrows are not raised that she, 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 she's the um, creme de la creme or she's the, the extraordinary one that has risen there. Because so all of us get to that point where we are all seen as is, is seen as a normal thing. If one or two of us go above there, we are seen as the oddity, or we are seen as the oh, just that shining star that is you know the one off thing. But we must we we must all be there such that it, it doesn't it doesn't create any ripples. Let let me just give a mundane example that comes when you see a nurse a female nurse. I am amazed. No, no, people just assume that all nurses should be female, you know. And so when you see a, a woman CEO or a woman politician or, uh, uh, you know, a woman president or whatever, it should just be, okay, fine. I mean, women have the right to be there. They are there. They are contributing. And that's it. You, you, you get it. So for me, only then will it be enough. Well, Dr. Kumbo. Okay. How much is enough? Well, I, I am always not very comfortable about numbers because the numbers are relative. Uh, if we're going statistically, I, I, I'm not sure why the 40% was actually fixed, given the fact that 51.2% in the case of Ghana are women. I, I will think that what we need to do is to ensure that instead of looking at mathematical figures, we begin to seed very safe constituencies. And that is the one I can give a figure. That you decide that in almost every political party, they should seed 50% of their safe seats to women. And then we are likely to have a number that will tell us that even with this leverage that has been given, this is what we are able to get. Because there's also the challenge that you might run into a difficulty in which the, the, the figure is given, but how to even feel it becomes difficult. I remember when I was with CPA and chairing that committee I mentioned earlier, we made a pledge and I did indicate that if I would have a woman that was prepared to contest the 2016 elections, I was prepared to set an example by stepping down from my seat and supporting the lady to come. I went to my constituency and went round. In fact, I've called women who were on pension, some still working at the level of district directors of health, regional education directors. And it was always Okay, Ben, let me think about it. Of course, I found ways of seeing what they think about it was. They went back to the same males, their husbands. <laughs> and the husband says that, tell Ben to mind his own business and don't get involved in our domestic matters. And to be honest with you, they all turned it down. Of course, one that was very enthusiastic, it was based on health grounds. But that is why it is a bit challenging to indicate numbers in absolute terms. Mm -hmm. A lot of work needs to be done before we can get to the specific situation of numbers. And that environment of safe seats. And I keep using land as a typical example. Oh, you go to um, a questionnaire, you ask people, you say, ah, but where are you coming from with this idea that women don't get access to land? I said, well, just give me an example in this community where the women lands are. You're going to find that the lands are likely seven kilometers away where the crops are prone to be destroyed by animals, 
very arid land, if it is nearer the house, where the fertility of the soil is non-existent and nothing will come out of it. And yet, the idea is that nobody stops a woman from having land. It is about the same thing. I said, that, well, who is preventing a woman from becoming a member of parliament? They are forgetting of the structures. And it's these structures that I am concerned about. How to loosen them and make the mobility of women into the political arena easier. We are doing this not because we are doing a reverse discrimination, but we are addressing a situation of a historical imbalance, which is structural. And you cannot deal with a historical imbalance without reversing that particular history. And that is, for me, what I think is very, very important and we need to be doing. And lastly, you see, we don't seem to hear or listen to what the women are saying. And if we even hear them, we don't understand what they are saying. That is part of the problem with our policy intervention. The women are not asking to share anybody's buy. That is not the issue. They are interested in a completely new dish, cooked by all and shared equally by all. If we look at it in that way, so it's not anybody's share that women are going to take. So parliamentary political sphere is for men and women are sharing, okay, let's give them a figure. We even think that without we giving them that figure, they don't have that capacity to even get there. And that is for me what is said to me. Lastly, at the local level, if you look at the 30% or one third as it used to be, which was supposed to be a window in appointing women, you again run in. Who are the people who are to be con uh, consulted in composing that? Traditional rulers. And you know where that comes from. Interest groups, most likely the financially well to do forces in that particular area. Now, in that consultation process, the women are absent. They are not traditional rulers. They do not have any form of serious finance cap financial capital to be recognized as an interest group. They might not be leading a labor movement. They might not be occupying any position. So they will not even be present, just very much like how our customary law was constructed for us where only men, males met with the colonial administrators, came out with whatever constitution they had, the Gomba constitution, World constitution, and put it together and said, this is the customary law. No way of anybody as a woman being present and challenging the veracity of those customary laws. And our courts turned them out happily today and have turned them into precedent. And we are all singing hallelujah by saying, the constitution will provide for customary law, including what the courts have determined, even if they have misdetermined it. So it's a, it's a wider issue that we, we need to be looking at. Yes, it's, it's definitely a wider issue. And as um, actually Dr. Dakwa schooled me on the symbolism of women in public office. And in most of the literature, they say, when you look at Ghana's independence, you have six men. But in between each of those men were women on which they built that foundation. And so the media has a, as the media is key in making sure that women in public office is well represented. And um, Professor, Professor Gajapo. Yes. Can you take us through how the media has been instrumental in getting us there or not? Sure. And I will in a minute, but I cannot help before I get there, reacting to some of the issues raised by Dr. Kumbo, which I agree with, but I think also need to be nuanced. So for example, uh, Dr. Kumbo talked about the women should, I guess be, those were not your words, be more assertive and push back, push back some more. And I'm yes. saying, no, that's the point I made earlier, that there's got to be a, a, a shift in the political culture that makes it possible for women to be comfortable in that culture, you see? So it, if you're making sexist and misogynistic uh, jokes, why should I steal myself and take it? 
if you are heckling and cat calls, why should I have to abide by that? I think it's the culture that must change, not the women to adapt to a culture that we all know is not a good culture for both the men and the women. So there has to be a change in the political culture and in, in, in the ways you do business. Let me give another, it seems, try, I really love your presentations, Dr. Kumbo, because when you talked about even where the laboratory is situated for women vis-a-vis -vis men, it tells you that whoever was building that, knowing it was a parliament, assumed there won't be women there. So as for the laboratory, the women, must go downstairs while it must be easy for the men. We need to, to really see what's behind um, these things. Talking to their husbands, they live in a patriarchal society. You were talking about the patriarchal uh, uh, structures. Can you imagine a woman who doesn't consult her husband before she gets into politics? She'll be in trouble. So there are, there are just certain sanctions and consequences women because they are women have to face if they decide to go against the grain that men don't so a husband who doesn't tell his wife that um she's he's she, he wants to go into politics well maybe the wife may may frown or something you know but there's not hell to pay <laughs> am i lying dr kumbo shake your head if i'm i'm right versus well. a woman who won't go and consult and get permission from her husband first before she goes into the political terrain. So having said that, I just needed to, to throw that in. Let me come back to the media. And we have to understand that the media is a cultural institution. And all of these points we are making is about the, the cultures in which we operate. But we also know that, you know, um, for democracy, oxygen, information and communication is the oxygen of democracy. Therefore, the media is so key because in a modern society, they are the ones who bring us information and communication about who to vote for, what the, the, the issues are uh, that you must vote on, who is, um, who is running, et cetera, et cetera. So if the media do not cover women well, and we know politics is also about visibility, the more you are visible, the, 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 the more you are likely, that's why people buy ads. Uh, political uh, uh, season is advertising cocoa season. They buy ads in order to gain visibility. And, and therefore the media really matters in that way. So we need to ask what kind of visibility do women in, 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 in politics get from the media? And importantly, what kind of coverage do they get? How are their issues raised? What are, are they, focusing on. So the amount of coverage, the kind of coverage and the visibility, you know, is really very important. And we know studies have shown, studies in Ghana, studies elsewhere, have shown that male politicians get more coverage than female politicians. Is it because they pay for it? Is it because they pay for it? Maybe part of it may be because they pay for it, but part of it is also because the media tend to be drawn to certain personalities. You know, it, it's quite complex, not just one simple thing. So the media will go where they think the news is being generated. Let me give you an example. So you, you know we have three women presidential aspirants, don't we? Yeah, we do. In this race, how much do we hear from them? How visible are they? Well, the PPP you could, has been quite visible. Okay. You could argue that they are from minority parties, but how much visibility do they get? How much visibility do women in, 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 in parliament get unless they, they sort of um, do something, shall I say, a bit sensational? Mm -hmm. So we see that in, when women are in politics, a lot of the time they are being covered, their appearance, they are, and, and it's not just here, their appearance or they say something out of time, they say things that a, a woman is not supposed to be saying. Those kinds of things dog women. And then women, because of 
culture and their upbringing are reticent also. So in a certain sense, you could say it's the fault of the women, but we have to understand why they are reticent in being vocal and in putting themselves forward in order to survive in the political terrain. I'm glad Dr. Kumbo mentioned something about the floor of parliament. And it reminded me of a media foundation study in 2014 that showed that women in parliament were not talking, were not contributing enough to the political discourse. And that's a problem because if they don't, they don't gain visibility. They are not seen as um, sort of uh, politicians with gravitas, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a problem there that even the women themselves have to try and overcome no match for, for now, even though the, 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 the environment may be a, a, a bit hostile to them. Uh, but also, therefore, there are there have been programs, again, Media Foundation had a program where it started early to try and get women to appear in, 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 in television, uh, radio, radio shows so that they would arrange for them to appear on radio shows. And, and, and again, there was difficulty. Difficulty because there just were not enough women and also difficulties because of a structural issue. What's that structural issue? A lot of the political parties have designated people as their spokespersons. And often the spokespersons, the, the political communicators are the Rottweilers. People who can go toe to toe, say all kinds of things, give it to the opposition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And the, 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 the women were not the Rottweilers, really, most of the time. A few may be, but you know. <laughs> and so in the end, again, there's a certain losing out of that. So how they build their political portfolio uh, becomes a problem. And like I said, sometimes the media pick on the trivial when it comes to women and they magnify it. And, and so the representation of women in, in the political space comes back. I remember a long time ago, I, was, I saw a headline in a, a, a newspaper, it said, the, the women in the NDC parliament, in a paper that I thought uh, was usually hostile to the NDC. And I thought, oh, great, I'm glad. When you read the article, what are they complaining about? That there are a certain kind of women, women who can't marry, women who don't have husbands, oh, nasty, okay? That kind of representation, you know, doesn't encourage other women to want to be in, in politics. Uh, online, now we are in an era of social media. There's a lot of trolling and there's a lot of um, online harassment of women who are seen as entering the political space in ways that, you know, uh, social media users don't like. And they, it, it can really be hectic. And so for women who are raised not to be fighting dirty, then they, they withdraw because they don't want to fight dirty. And in fact, I have to say, why should anybody have to fight dirty? But it is a dirty game. And if you want to succeed, you have to fight dirty. Okay, so, so, so those would be some of my thoughts on that. And you know, it's interesting. I also was following the um, media's representation of women in public life. And there has been, I must admit, there has been a gradual improvement of the pictures of the women they put in their in the um, print media, because at first you see angry looking women, women who uh, look like they're here to fight, but now you see women looking, they, they, the selection of pictures is very, very attractive and it makes people relate to the women who are being portrayed as um, women in public office. And I must commend the media for that. The print. Yes, actually, you're right. And I have to also consider that some of the, um, some of the coverage has improved, but I still can't help but point out, including with uh, uh, the uh, PPP presidential candidate, sometimes mm -hmm. there's a portrayal of novelty. Uh, Susan was talking about, I want it to be normal. Don't raise your eyebrow because she's a woman. So it's yeah. not because she's a woman, it's because she's a politician with certain attributes. Otherwise, even the line of interviewing, even the nature of coverage is dwelling on her being a woman 
the, the uniqueness of her being a woman rather than um, what is what are the issues she stands for, what is her agenda, what is her track record on this, what is her track record on that. Yeah. But you know, we, um, apart from seeing women and um, hearing about women or hearing of women arguing political points to attract other women and the generation coming up to enter the political space. Dr. Kumbo mentioned several things that if women were at the decision-making table will definitely shift our development agenda. And so we ask the question, why should we have women? Apart from the fact that it's, we are looking at equity and representation, why should we have women? Asha, let me say something. We should have women because if we want more women there, we should push women there. I mean, the issue, especially in, in political parties of having a mentor or a godfather or something like that. And if you don't have, um, you can have a, a godfather, but he's male and he can empathize and can understand only to a certain level because some of the discriminations are very subtle. And if you, if you, you are not a woman, you just might not even feel it or even notice it. You, 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 you get it. It's just, they're very, very subtle. And being a woman, then you, 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 you would feel it. You can have a male that is, is, is sympathetic. He understands, he empathizes and wants, and wants to help. But he, 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 it is only to a certain level. So there ought to be more women there so that they can pull more women up you know, and, and, and bring more women up because they, the, um, your, your mentor, or your godmother there will be able to, to say, oh, this one, you know, this is what it means and you can, this is how to react and this is how I reacted to it and you can gain from her experience. So if we don't get more women in there, we definitely will not have the, the role models to push more women. It becomes a vicious circle. So even just for the fact that we should get more women there who can pull more women up, who can be mentors to, to other women, who can be godmothers to, to an up and coming young women politicians, we, will, we, we, will, we are going nowhere. And having, you see, sometimes it's, it's just little, little, little things that um, you know, be, be, become very important. And we talked about the lavatory um, 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 case, the where you know somebody just not even thinking about it, just you know, that, no thought went into it actually because it, they didn't even consider the women to be there, so no thought at all. It wasn't you know, and you you find that I went to the stadium once, and I went to the the washroom, and there were no mirrors, and I was like. Wow, no mirrors. It must have been a man who designed this thing. Because how can you have a washroom with no mirrors? No woman will have a washroom with, without a mirror. And if there had been a woman in that, um, you know, just in that planning committee or in the architecture firm or wherever, would have realized that the washroom, especially for a woman's washroom, must have, must have mirrors. And I've given you this supposedly innocuous example, but it affects many, many aspects of our lives. You, you understand? And if you don't have somebody who is there that understands it, mm -hmm. the decisions will not be made in the favor of the 51%. Yeah. And that's but what I must, ask, I must ask, Akosia, um, would more women have an impact on corruption, reducing corruption? I mean, you are asking me this as have we done the studies or do I think yes. that it will make a difference? Yes. I mean, case. there are different schools of thought on this. There are schools of thought that say corruption is not gendered. Corruption is, you are raised in a particular environment and some things are normalized, right? So all of us will have those normalizing tendencies. There are other schools of thought that say women will have a particular approach to how the money gets spent. 
So they'll feel a little more concerned that we have all of these pressing issues and the monies are being spent on other kinds of things. So there are two different ways of looking at it. For me, I agree with Susan that you need their bodies in there to spread out the work. When Dr. Kumbwa was speaking, he was speaking about how there can be a business committee and there'll be only four women. Yeah. If there are four women to 16 men and they have to form subcommittees, we'll soon run into a problem because the women are not enough to go all around. So we'll soon have some subcommittees without women. Or if you are feeling burdened as a woman, I have to be here, I have to be there. Then you find that you're on three committees when the men are on one, one committee each. There's a problem when you are token, when there are not enough of you. There needs to be enough of you. So you begin to see things differently and act out, act based on that difference in perception. Take our educational system and take the messaging that girls and boys get about who can or cannot be in public office. The media is one. It starts at home. It's reinforced in many, many subtle ways at school. So if you are in charge of the educational policy and so you are looking at the textbooks, some of the things that a man is probably looking at and not quite noticing that this is a problem, you suddenly might notice. So. How many of you notice when you read textbooks and find the examples, the names, if you take stories in our textbooks, our primary school books, even just the in naming, you can literally count and figure out that there'll be many more names of boys than there'll be of girls. So just in writing the stories, right? Then there are all the things about the depictions of men. There's a class three textbook. I'm quite sure it's still being used in this country which basically says mothers, are, are, mothers take care of the home and fathers pay the bills. Now, that might be what you want to say, but you have to ask, even in the classroom that you are giving them this textbook, how many children will find that their lives mirror that, right? And how is it that we still have those books? I dare anyone to show me that they don't exist anymore. We are reproducing it daily. The children come home from class three with these books. They give us questions. We mark, we sign year on, year on. Now, if you are telling girls and boys that girls are at home and men pay their bills, how do you expect her when she's now a married woman that when Dr. Kumbo finds her and says, I'm going to give you the seat, she's going to be thinking this is normal. You've been telling her as Nigerians who say saints that this is not what we are supposed to be doing. You can't expect her to be doing otherwise. And the point about these are subtle, right? So mm -hmm. you might be empathetic, but you, until you are on the receiving end of it, you might not even notice that this is a problem, that this is a slight to, to her, that this is not the way in which she should be treated or should be experiencing this in these kinds of spaces. So until we have the women in those spaces, able to pick up on things and say, wait a minute, this can't be right. When the road to Ebri was being built, you know, we are now have a nice um, dual, carriage. dual carriage, right? It took a very long time. And every time I went on that road, I thought, do you know how this has fundamentally disrupted the lives of the traders? And it was, this was like a two, three year saga. And I kept thinking every time I went up that road, that the women who now have to figure out how they are going to get their goods from that mountain to Medina and where, can you imagine how stressful that was for three good years? And you are thinking, meaning all the different entities that have to come together to build that road. Was there no way in which they could have hastened that process so that the stresses would be less? And I'm guaranteeing you, it probably was not on people's radar screens. It didn't. And they weren't being mean. This just didn't come up as an issue, right? So those are the kinds of things. When Susan was giving her example, she said they are mundane. They may be mundane, but it gets reproduced in every single thing as well. So it starts from the mirror that's missing to no names for girls in the storybooks. And somebody says, oh, what's the big deal? It's just a storybook. To the more influential things about what will happen now when we are distributing resources and think about how long this project will take or not take, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's the ways in which I think it is crucial that women are present. And then finally, women should be present just because. 
we don't have these conversations about what's the purpose of the men in parliament. And they are there and we vote them in every year. And for that same reason, the women should be there too. The women shouldn't be held to a higher standard that when they are there, they will do certain things. And that's the only reason why I should put them there. But men, they can go do nothing. It's okay. That's their space. So they don't have to do anything. But women show up, they have to check the boxes. Otherwise, they don't deserve to be there. To be there. Men can come and do nothing. It's okay. That's where they belong. So for me, they, we, girls, you know, when Kamala Harris made her speech, she talked about so that a six-year-old now will watch me on television for the next four years. And it's subtle messaging. She doesn't have to say anything. But you watch her for four years. And by the time you are 10, you think, ah, it's okay. It's perfectly normal to be vice president. I saw it happen all the time. So women, for me, it's not about what did they bring to parliament. It's about these are spaces that should be equally as available to the men as they are to the women. When they are both there, then we give both of them the same marching orders and say the two groups go and make things happen for Ghana. We cannot have a situation where we expect more from the women than we do from the men. So it's a space that is a, the right of women. It's not a privilege that is going to be given to them. And I must, um, Dr. Cynthia Adukwe Tego um, put in a point saying that socialization of our girls and boys will have to change early and from our homes to allow each group to still find space to operate without the other feeling intimidated, unwanted or intruding in the other space and avoiding the feeling of entitlement to that space in politics by the other. Definitely that feeling of entitlement is deeply entrenched, is very deeply entrenched. And at this point, we are going to have to move the conversation towards how do we get there? How do we get there to enough? Is it 41% or 40% or 50%? And between 40 and 51%, that's 100 women in parliament and 140 women in parliament. That's where we are. Between 100 women in parliament and 140 women in parliament. How do we get there? Do we take the strategy of the, um, the People's Bill of 1960 and say we should have this number of women there and work towards getting that number of women there? What strategies are we looking at? Dr. Kumbo? Well, I guess that the strategy will depend very much. I have always had the feeling that one institution that we've not looked at from the gender perspective is the political party. If you look at the political parties until recently, apart from the women's wing, you don't see women in any other office within the political parties. And yet, that is where the future government recruits its cadres from. And so if the political party is not in sync with these trends, regardless of the numbers that would be given whether statutorily or not, it would not work. So I think we have to begin with the political parties, sensitizing the political parties and making sure that there, is, there are women voices and very, very important voices right within the party structures that we have. When that is done, you can see the knock-on effect. For instance, when district chief executives are going to be appointed, the local parties have an input. You have three males, one male proposed to the party. And when they appear before the constituency executive, the woman is priced out. By the time they get to the region and to the national, there's no single woman there to be recommended for the office. And this starts from the political party. Most political parties are also very assertive today to such an extent that they even want to determine who would be a candidate in a particular area. And that is why it's important. It's very much like the, 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 the cradle of what we will be having eventually as government in all its facets. And if that cradle is not properly placed or it's not dealt with with agenda lenses, I, I'm afraid that whatever you do cannot be done upstream, knowing very well that the leverage within the political party structure 
is very, very important because a broad rendition of Article 55 on how political parties must respect the constitution, the laws of the country and must conduct their affairs along democratic lines. There's nothing that is more significant than to say in a democracy, you should reflect the numbers of the population, whether in a, in a, a, a proportional representation system, that should be seen within the decision-making levels of either the local government at parliament within the executive cabinet and other public institutions. So the first area that I think we should be looking at is the political parties. And I will not really uh, have any misgivings if we go back and look at what really happened in 1960 and try to do the adaptation and the context in which came, it came up. The possibility is there that if the context has changed fundamentally and we, we, we were to try to reproduce it, you might run into a number of challenges. Because again, most of these things are going to be decisions. And most of the people taking these decisions, the majority would be men. And majority of those men are going to be people that are still living under patriarchy and have a particular mindset. Uh, some bills came to parliament when I was there. And I used to say that I know that I might leave parliament and these bills will never see the day of light. Just because even at the preliminary stages, culture came in, religion came in, and it was always easier to shelve some of these bills than to be very proactive with them as you see, and it's because for a bill to become law, one of the most important things, not even the content, right? I laugh at the public when they, they are debating the bills that come to parliament and it's like they are looking at the content and the quality. The political climate and the, the, the environment in parliament at any particular point is very important in determining the quality, the speed with which a bill passes into law. And that's why I said that I used to look at a law that comes out from parliament when I was a law student as something sacrosanct. That's the law. And it's something you must hold very dear to. When I went and was part of the lawmaking process, I must say I have since lost much <laughs> of that respect that an hour that I had for law. Because I now know laws come from sleeping MPs. They come from MPs who say, yeah, yeah, have never been in parliament. They actually come from MPs who are negotiating their own welfare as a precondition for the content and the content of the law is not important. There are all sorts of things that go into what comes out eventually as law. And that is why I think that we must be looking at that environment. In, you, you can't touch it. You, you can't see it in its fiscal sense, but it is, a very unique way. And I have looked at particular bills now that I've left parliament, I'm looking at them very closely. And I go back to the official report, I look at what was happening politically in the country at that time. And I say, now I can understand the defects that are in this bill. It will have nothing to do with bad drafting. It will have everything to do with the particular political climate at that particular time. And that is why in shaping that political climate, which is the next level, gender issues must also come in. And it should be possible to create a gender environment within parliamentary arrangements, which cre creates the very permissive environment for a number of the thinking and the ideas that we are raising here. I would also yeah. want to indicate that when you are, you've not had that experience, it looks very easy, it's like a football match. When you are looking at it from the touchline as a spectator, you see how easy it is to score the goal. But when you get into the field, you begin to realize things that you never anticipated were more important in shaping the outcomes of decisions than the rules that we all know. And that there are soft rules, actually, that become more fundamental in shaping the outcome of decision-making processes from the local and the national level than we know. Government is one of them. When you, you, you've not served in government at a very high level, you, you look at issues very differently. 
But when you get in, you now begin to say, uh, now I understand why this is done this way. For instance, take the, the, the lines, whip line system that we have in parliamentary practice. It is not in any law for anybody to challenge, but it's part of the Westminster model. Whether it's a one line whip, it's a three line whip. And I give different names to these whips. Of course, the standing orders will tell you when your party gives a one line whip, it's like, well, you should you are, be creative enough, you are independent, take a decision, the best decision. When they give a two line whip, no, you must make sure that clauses A, B, C, D do not get in. You are, you are not supposed to ask a question. When it's a three line whip, it technically means you are not even required to think. A three line whip tells you, just do it. Don't even think. No conscientious objection in matters of this nature. The consequences of no following a three line whip are very, very obvious to the parliamentary future of any parliamentarian. These are not in the public domain. And these are things that the way they manifest themselves. And nobody announces a whip. You have the forces of darkness as we call them. And <laughs> as you are getting to the point of taking that decision, a subtle message is moved. And when they say it's a trail line whip, only a few of the experienced parliamentary reporters would know that this is what has happened. And experienced members of parliament would know that when you start seeing the whips of both sides moving around the corridors, then you know they are going to invoke something very heavy on almost everybody. So, so just Dr. soft Dr. sides, Dr. yes. With your experience, with your experience, I'm going to ask a question. Actually, the question was posed by Wendy Bannerman, and it's either a yes or no, because you have inside, inside experience. Will the affirmative action bill ever be passed into law? I would say yes and no, <laughs> because if you watch what is going on, it should have been law by now. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, 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 the area of practice on affirmative action policies, the delay in parliament allows it to be overtaken by development. Mm -hmm. And so by the time you get to the consideration stage, new developments and new international treaty obligations come into play. And they say, well, we have to go back and factor this issue in. And so any form of delay, whether intentional or not, will always create a problem for fluid areas like the affirmative action bill. But I have talked to a number of current parliamentarians. And the idea is that we are just left with crossing some T's and dotting the I's but we believe that it would come in. But again, I was very pessimistic because I said, how did you resolve this particular clause like we had with the definition of a domestic environment where it came to domestic violence bill? Because those are some of the things that are holding. The courts are beginning to rule in this country and expanding the areas and the frontiers. And mm -hmm. they have to always be going back. But I believe that you can never get a perfect legislation. If the will is there, pass it. And when you have the problem, the amendment procedure becomes easier. Then uh, we're definitely, we definitely going to keep our fingers crossed because we need that affirmative action bill. And in that, um, we're looking at the legislature that would help get women into um, public space. and. Was there any way that um, in the law we could discourage and great treat and all suggestive comments against women in politics? Well, yes, they, 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 are, they are what they call these. We were, I have not seen the final copy of the ethical rules that are being developed for parliament, which has also not yet been adopted and in the new standing orders. If these find expression in the standing orders and in the code, of conduct and ethic for members of parliament. It covers even parliamentary reporters once you are within the environs of parliament or you are involved in parliamentary activity. I think that is the area that we can actually locate it and make sure that the de is deterrent effects are sufficiently strong. Unfortunately, again, you are dealing with structures. Most, some of these statements are made unconsciously. 
you need a level of exposure in terms of the, the males, as I will say, to be able to understand that what you take for granted is not the same way that women interpret these things and take them. And you must, you can become a woman, but for God's sake, you would have to get back to that feeling that your mother is a woman, your sister is a woman, your auntie is a woman. And yes. then you are then in a position to, to, to reorient your mind. Most of it is also in the mind and the attitude. I want to give you a typical example about socialization. You imagine the type of things we still teach in our university. We still teach in our schools, particularly what I refer to as eugenic science. I, I don't know whether if you decide to say that uh, in, in genetic arrangements, that a plus is the genetic denotation of a man and a minus is the genetic denotation of a woman. And everybody knows that a minus, when you get it in class, is bad, is negative. And a plus is positive. So when people transpose these things from physical sciences into social sciences, they are bound to grow up with that mentality. Yeah. And that is why I think and many, many more of the classics that we still teach, and we don't critique them sufficiently. I know people still cite Immanuel Kant, they still cite Plato and things, but not putting it in the context of what these classics taught about women, and they will rationalize it intellectually. You see, they were writing for their times, and they were living in a class society of slaves and things like that. We, we, we need to really develop this particular to insist that we think in the contemporary context of acquiring knowledge becomes important. And you know, the interesting thing is, and um, I think you touched on it, and Professor Dapa also touched on it, about the um, party primaries. Actually, Dr. Um, Professor Bauer asked in the questions, how do, how, what about the party primaries? How do we impact the, um, how do we get political parties to increase the number of women who um, participate in their primaries? Because that pretty much is the recruitment grounds for women in um, political office. Professor Dapa. So I think this is where Dr. Kumbo's point about political parties is important. Because I think political parties have to make a concerted effort. It's not just about creating women's wings and saying, okay, we have a women's wing and we've solved the problem. It's yeah. by having a concerted plan that we are going to ensure that this party includes men and women. So um, the point about safe seats, for example, or you say to your, your um, party members, look, we have to grow the party membership to include both men and women in fairly equal numbers. And then when we are encouraging them to vote, we are encouraging both the men and the women to vote, to stand for the election. That way, both of them are there. And then the parties are supporting both the men and the women. I mean, there are cases in this country where people are basically, women are being told to you step aside and let, so then, the, the women go and go independent because they are being told you step aside and let this man go. So if you are told that, then you step aside and then if you want to continue, you have to continue as an independent candidate. We have to create those spaces at the political party level where women and men have equal chances of standing in an election. But we have to remember that when they stand, they have to be voted for. And at that point also, then the whole discussion we've had about socialization comes in. And I think in, in thinking about takeaway messages, we have to walk away from this conversation knowing that the responsibility for there being more women in parliament is on all of us. We yeah. have to create the institutional structures. We have to put in place the laws and we have to change the ways in which we raise our children both at home, at school, in what we are teaching. And there's nothing like, it, it doesn't matter, it's subtle. In the songs we think are acceptable, in the, in the things we are telling. So all these conversations about, oh, like nobody runs around trying to marry off young boys, but we are constantly marrying off young girls. And when that's said to your daughter, you shouldn't find it funny and be encouraging of it. 
No, she's not trying to be married to you. She's trying to be the next president of Ghana. So she doesn't have time to be married to you in, in 20 years. Because it's these subtle messages, right? That creates a space where we have the women, but we are not necessarily likely to get as many men to vote for them. What is very encouraging in the Ghanaian statistics we have so far though, is when the women stand, they get voted for. So that suggests at least at the parliamentary level that if they win the primaries and they get to stand at the national level, they will get voted for in fairly equal numbers. The problem is winning at the party primary level. And you know, um, Susie O mentions, um, she makes a suggestion or an assertion that gender inequality is at the core of our culture. And if we really want to change, we should start from the earlier stages um, in teaching our children to think. It should, we sh it should be the sensitization should be, yes, women can also be president. Yes, women are also MPs. Um, it's interesting, Adobia Chum asks, do women, do a large um, ratio of Ghanaian women actually have the desire to participate in political leadership? Susan, do you want to take that? That's what I talked about, that the, the ambition gap in saying that women are not ambitious enough is wrong. And it is only because the environment in which they find themselves is not friendly. And so I wish women are rational beings. And so if you think it's too much trouble and you, you know, you would rather than take a, a, a backseat and think about it and say, look, I mean, um, why go through all this and not be who I am? And, 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 and be accepted for who I am, but I have to, to, to go through all this stress. And so that is why, yes, the political parties are, are, are very, very important because if you find yourself in a political party, that is nurturing of leadership, irrespective of whether you're a woman or a man and recognizes that both women and men have ambition they will throw more women for it because they, they would then have a larger pool of talent to, 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 to put for it. So the political party is, is really is important because that is where the, it will start, it, uh, you know, uh, will be one of the great determining steps in getting women there. But as all the other panelists, as the professor said, in, our, in the development of both boys and girls, at each time point, it's important that there are subtle messages sent out that women are just as capable and have, uh, you know, uh, uh, they they should be there. You 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 get it. So in 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 in, in when we are in class three, it should not be. And uh, to be honest, Prof, that thing I had an issue with. I went to my daughter's school, and and had an issue at the PTA. Why you say? What do girls do? Girls look after the baby. Girls wash the dishes. Then it goes, what do boys do? Boys wash the car. Boys, this is... And one lady got up and said, they had marked her son's um, work wrong because they asked, what do mothers do? And he had written, mothers pay the school fees. And she was a single mother. She was paying the school fees. And they had marked her son wrong. She was livid. <laughs> you know, she said... How do you tell them that it's boys that pay, uh, it's a father that pay the school fees when I'm a mother and I'm paying the fees and that is what my son has written and you've marked him wrong. You, you understand? Our education system must change. It must recognize that girls are just as intelligent. Girls have the same leadership skills and have the right to be there. And those subtle messages must go along so that even boys growing up, Recognize that it is okay for the girl to want to be the school prefect and compete with me. It is okay for the girl to want to be an MP and compete with me and that that should not be taking the seat. I'll give you another example. You know, I contested as a, a what you call it, uh, uh, for the district assembly. One of the gentlemen on the district assembly had the nerve one day to stand in front of uh, the, uh, the platform that they are given and said that, me, instead of wanting to be his girlfriend, I am coming to compete with him. Oh. I mean, you can imagine the shock on my face. I mean, like, like, where is this guy coming from? But that is the thinking that, you know, you, you get out there, they think that, ah, but you, you should be my girlfriend and you should rather be in my bed and you are standing here trying to compete with me. 
that message must go out to both boys and girls that the girl has a right to be there. She has the right to compete. She has equal leadership skills and, 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 and that she, didn't, should not, she should not be seen to be um, secondary or she should be in, in, in you know, you, you, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say, but. but it's the right to be there. The space is not just for men, yes. but for women too. You know, um, an anonymous attendee uh, mentions, he said having male allies in the political space is equally important in the effort to increase women representation in politics. And I definitely will say, Dr. Kumbo, you have shown that you're an ally to um, increasing women's participation and we are definitely grateful. I'm going to call in Professor Gajapo to um, tell us how are we going to get there through the media? Um, thank you. I'm going to tell you how you get there, not necessarily through the media, but a very important point I wanted to add to the debate about um, the structures. And I really appreciate Dr. Kumbo's point about um, looking at the party structures, but I would say it should start from where people are most conscientized in politics, which is the universities. And at the universities, you begin to see the gendering already happening. Mm -hmm. So who is running for SRC? And who is the treasurer? And one time I asked them, why is it that women are always treasurers? Comes back to the, the point you asked uh, Professor Dakwa about corruption. They say, oh, when the women are treasurers, they don't steal the money. So women have become the de facto treasurers of student politics, whilst the men vie for the other positions, the president positions, the vice president positions, etc. But in a lot of places, Political grooming starts very early, including uh, especially at the university level. Our universities, the political parties have um, uh, wings, TN and Tesco. Who, who, what are the structures in there? Where are the women in there? So I will say that we should start at that level, even before we get to the party level. No, but and also, also that yes. isn't quite late because from what I remember about the university level, it's very late and it's just a few few very um, strong and assertive women who are able to break out into that space. And you know, they've created the Women's Commission. So that Women's Commission seems to be a safe space for women. If no, we but earlier- But that's exactly what I'm challenging. Of course, earlier is fine. I mean, somebody's already talked about leadership in, uh, in, 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 in being a prefect, et cetera, I think Susan said it. But mm -hmm. the political organizations in this country start from the university. They don't start from uh, secondary schools necessarily, not as robustly. So mm -hmm. I am suggesting that we need to look and work harder at those levels because it is those, if you look and if you write a history of people in Ghanaian politics, you see that a lot of them yeah. started when they were in university. Yeah. And of course, they are all males. So I'm saying that we shouldn't ignore that level. And then coming back, and, 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 and you see, Dr. Kumbo said he would advocate, and I totally agree with him, 50% um, women um, are the primaries and mm -hmm. also in safe seats. Because sometimes when the argument comes, you can, there's a cynical way in which you will say, okay, let the woman contest, but let her contest in this seat that you know that your party is not going to win, but at least you can check the box and say, well, we did feel some women, is, except that the women didn't win. But that's partly because the women were not in safe seats. However, and I'm sure Dr. Kumbo knows better than me, when the women try to contest safe seats, that's where it's most resistant because power and privilege don't concede easily. And so I, I, I'm just full of admiration for uh, Dr. Kumbo that he was willing to cede his seat so that a, a, a woman could come in. I mean, you are very rare. In fact, if we will remember, the NPP tried an affirmative action and had to redraw because there was pushback from the party. And so I guess the way forward would be to be sure 
that you, you don't assume, you don't make it top down, but to start in your party early, trying to persuade people on the ground that it is important to have women in parliament and marshal the reasons why it, it inures to the benefit of the party. If you leave it at the last minute and it comes top down to say, uh, I think that this time no one should contest against a, a woman sitting MP, which seemed very reasonable to me, and I'm sure very reasonable to those in the MPP who decided that, but it didn't seem reasonable to other people, males who had aspirations, you see. So we've got to contend with that. And, and the media is a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a cons constant sort of orientation and battle. The Media Foundation for West Africa has just come out with elections guidelines for the media. And I was very thrilled that they had this portion um, on, on, on gender and, and also gendered language inside. So even the language you use to describe women uh, politicians and the language you use to dismiss something that they say is very important. And I think that if the media pays particular attention to those things and give women more visibility. I yeah. know that sometimes they, they argue that we can't find the women to come on our programs. Sometimes I say, but what, how much notice are you giving these women knowing that they have multiple roles and they can't just drop everything, you know? And what time is your program um, at? And what day is your program? I mean, so Saturday morning, you have this program, it, 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 it's tough. Mm -hmm. for a working woman, yes. you know, because it's that time that she has to organize her household. It would be nice if her husband would organize the household for her, but 10 to 1, that's not going to happen. Well, I, you know, I must, I must say that um, Susan, Dr. Edouard Mankwa, is a married woman with three adorable children and still money to make it for an early morning um, I think it was a Saturday morning political program for, for as long as I can remember. And she was always visible. She was always, we were hearing her all the time on the radio. It definitely can be done, but the system must allow women to do it, not by fighting it, but it should be easier. The system must be conducive for women. And as you say, the timing of the program the time of day and the time of week. And uh, let, me, let me pop in a quick one. I, I think that as a society or government, or we, we, we talk about girls in science and science and math, yeah? mm -hmm. girls in, in, in math and science. And there's a special program for girls in math and science. What about the special programs for girls in governance? You know, um, giving girls the opportunity to to grow as leaders and, and and shaping them as leaders and making them realize that look, it is not about an ability, you know, that is innate. Uh, I mean, a, a only in boys, but it's about an ability that is also found in 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 females. And you just by practice and by 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 guidance, you you can also go ahead to do it. There must be. Uh, deliberateness we must be deliberate about it it will it cannot just happen you you understand so far it's, it seems we've talked about it but it's and it's just happening and there hasn't been the deliberateness towards it maybe leadership government um you know i i, I don't know but that ought to happen maybe government also used to take and say look one of the things that is is setting women back is child care what can we do to improve child care for women, not just in politics, but women for, in business? I mean, instead of, in, uh, you know, there's a safe place to send your market woman, there's a safe place to send your child, you know, so that you can go to market safely. You are, you are a, a, you know, a, a worker. There's a safe place to send your child so that you can go and have peace of mind to work so that you don't push women, you know, out of not just politics, but the working space, etc., because they have to stay at home and look after their children. So mm -hmm. there must be the deliberateness, not just in terms of the affirmative action there, but in all spheres of, of, of life. But I think that women in governance, there should be that 
target, that intervention, you know, and it should be along all the time points, like I said, of our, uh, of our development from childhood to early adolescence to, uh, um, you know, young adulthood when they are in the university, et cetera, because that is when they come onto their own. I'm mm -hmm. always an advocate for girls' schools because I, you know, that mixed schools, because I say in the girls' school, you have the opportunity to bring her up to her own. She's confident. She, she knows what she's about. When she comes out and she goes to the university, which is mixed, she, she, she already knows who she is. She's, she's not about being the, the um, uh, you know, um, she, she knows who she is and what she wants, mm -hmm. you know, and she's confident enough to come out there and do that. There's the, there's the other argument, but I think that we should, we really should have deliberateness and pu put that, uh, those interventions in, in place. And actually, Susie O agrees with you. She said it should start from preschool, preschool. So when they are starting their ABCs, they are also talking about women and men in those spaces. I'm going to actually take a last question then, um, we're going to wrap up. If not, we're going to be here the whole day. So this question um, from Marilyn Eniwa goes to Dr. Kumbo. Women MPs in parliament are hardly made chairs of committees. Consistently, the chair of the gender committee is a woman, but even then there was once a male chair of that committee. Um, she would love to hear Dr. Kumbo's take on this. And um, Dr. Kumbo, Yes, thank you. Uh, I hope that's the Marilyn I've known for so many years. I'm sure what is in, yes, what again is about the numbers. When you're composing committee, there's a formula that is applied. And that formula is based on the numbers on the majority and minority sides. And as was indicated earlier, you would find that when you super sub impose in that formula a gender parity, it will again depend on the total number of women, if I'm not on the total number of women in parliament, but which side of the parliament, majority or major, minority that they belong to. The mathematics of it can sometimes get very, very difficult. The decision for who chairs a parliamentary committee is very interesting. In fact, whether in the majority or in the minority, consider the chairman of these parliamentary committees as shadow ministerial appointments in the case of the minority, and perhaps a compensation appointment in the majority for those who were not appointed ministers. Mm. So the consideration that go into constituting your minister or your cabinet are about the same considerations. So for instance, if you were to take region A, that they require regional balance. And you have had, you are on the majority side and in government there are six ministers and deputy ministers from that region. What you are going to get in parliament is that the region that has only one minister is likely to be compensated for in terms of the chairman of the committees. Mm. So in this particular issue, the gender doesn't become a factor in that particular situation. It is the mechanical formula that is being applied. And even if you insist, you know, there's a token provision that really irritates me when I read laws, that the board shall be composed of 25 people, two of which shall be women. I don't know what is in the magic two, but it is always two. Even if you were to put that there, there have been times that when you apply the formula, you might never get a woman in some uh, of the committees. That is part of it. It's purely a highly political decision as to who chairs, who becomes vice, who becomes ranking, and who becomes a vice ranking. But significantly on the gender committee, the few men that were there is, 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 is a very interesting thing. There was a time we had the only man that was on that gender committee, and there was something very unique. We found out that this gentleman was a bit not endowed with height and particularly had a voice that until you saw who was speaking, you might think it was a lady. So the question I asked was that, 
So are you sending this person to this committee because of these people? Or it's just a way, but that tells you the thinking. And he says, well, leader, I don't know why they send me there. Perhaps they think I look like a woman. I said, do you look like a woman? But I'll just say this again, have very subtle ways in which they do it. And so it is difficult and it is a challenge. That's why I take us back to the political party. If the political party is told that this time around, we have got this number of standing committees and this number of select committees, we want 15 chairpersons to be women. We want 20 chairpersons to be uh, uh, ranking members to be women. You will have the problem. But the 15 and 20 should not be given as an absolute figure. It should be given as a percentage that wherever women are available to be on that committee, the opportunity should be there for them to cheer. There are also the practical side of things. And again, parliament uh, conventionally, not to record some practices that have emerged, there are what they call the juicy committees and the dry committees. There's always a tough battle as to who chairs which committee. Even that tough battle is so unrelenting among men. Most women don't even just want to get me. Mm. And that for me is very, very significant. In fact, when there were a lot of international interventions on gender matters and in the parliamentary group, you could see suddenly that a number of men for whatever rewards they might get in being in that committee, were becoming very, very interested in wanting to join the gender committee. And when I was majority leader, I insisted that every trip outside this country, you must make sure that at least two to three women are on it from both the majority and the minority. When you're going to train your parliamentarians in the Commonwealth when every new parliament comes, I used to go with the parliamentarian. And there was a particular year that when I went with them, they were eight, and only three were women, but these were names given by their sides. And there was very little you could do about it. We suffered the embarrassment because when we got into the uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary Avenue and they were putting us in committee, we got to the point that in very important committees, no Ghanaian woman would be available to go. So men ended up going. So a lot of exposure is needed that people must see that the international landscape is beginning to change. And if you remain fixed in your patriarchal mentality in Ghana, you will be embarrassed like a minister, I will not mention his name, who liked to attend every conference by himself to the extent that he attended a conference for women without knowing and ended up being the only male there when there were many females in the ministry. These things do happen. Yes. So yes. I, I, I guess that is. I can't give a direct answer, but it is interlaced with a lot of high politics and all sorts of considerations. Yes, but I think, um, well, uh, one point that was put up was that change is difficult and sometimes painful. But I think what we can all agree on is that there is the intent, there definitely is the push for change, and there is the intent to change. But how do we change? We're looking at either 50% of safe seats or we're looking at, should it be as draconian as draconian as saying there should be a law that says 50% of women in parliament, 50% of parliamentarians should be women. So there are definitely a lot of strategies that um, the input from the panelists have um, shone light on. And I'm very sure the law school, the Ghana Law School is gonna to put together these suggestions and table it as a paper. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for those who chipped in, who um, signed in and joined the, um, the process. Thank you for all your questions. I would like to thank our panelists again, Dr. Susan Edouard Mankwa, um, Dr. Benjamin Kumbo, Dr. Gajepo, and Dr. Professor, hey, these professor, Dr. people. The Professor Akosia Dakwa and Professor Audrey Gadjepo, it's been amazing having this conversation with you. And um, yes. I don't think and, we can and there was there was no gender balance actually here because I'm the only one. <laughs> indeed, indeed, but you made up for it. 
<laughs> yes, but I, I see you. Yes. Thank you, Audrey. Long time. Yeah. I know. Okay, I'll let you catch up after after we um, <laughs> sign off. But thank you so much, and thank you for bringing all your expertise and your um, experience to the table. I would like to introduce the next panel, which would come off on 3rd December 2020 at 1 p.m. is Adapting Tax, Labor, and Corporate Regulation to a Post-COVID World, the Fierce Urgency of Now. So that is coming off on 3rd December 2020 at 1 p.m. Thank you all so very much. It's been a very, very illuminating conversation. And I hope we get to do this again, not over Zoom, but maybe we can organize it by the Fireside program yeah, somewhere. I and sit down and exchange ideas and hope we can push change um, forward. Thank you very much. Have Thank a great you. night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye Prof. Bye. Bye. Bye.